morning. Glad to be with you. And I, I don't know if there's something wrong with me. Maybe I just live down south too long. I, I enjoy driving across the countryside right now with all this beautiful gleaming white. <laughs> of course, it's not quite as nice when I step out onto the parking lot and there's a little ice under my plug. So I, I, don't, I would like one without the other, but it doesn't work that way, does it? But God has made a beautiful world that we get to live in. And as we come together this morning, I encourage you to be in prayer this week. Uh, we have a presidential inauguration, which sometimes feels kind of uneventful. We just figure it's going to we'll walk on by. And there's reason to pray these days. We want to pray for peace in our country, and we want to pray for righteousness to rule in our nation's decisions. So be in prayer for our leaders that, that God will do his work and preserve us. And also want to just mention to you, uh, if you drive by the building this afternoon, you will see uh, some cars out in the parking lot this afternoon. We have the beginning of services for a congregation called New Changing Life. They will be worshiping in the language of Newer. Um, if you want to take Newer lessons, I'm sure they'll arrange it for you if you want to worship with them. They are from South Sudan, so by Ethiopia in Africa. And they've been meeting in, in a house up until this point. So they've been maxing out at 15 to 20 people. So yesterday they got some of their kids together to practice for singing today. And I walked in here yesterday afternoon as they were practicing, and they had 20 kids. So I think they might have more than 15 to 20 people as, as, yeah. as they gather, because they do allow adults too. So it's, it's, we are glad to see more people coming together in the name of Jesus. And so if you see you know, extra cars, that's what's going on. They will be worshiping on Sunday afternoons. And I may even have their pastor, Pastor Thomas, read a scripture verse and, and greet us this morning during the service. But as we come together, together let us call on the name of the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Let's stand together and sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Yeah, right. 
set off from here. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The responsive reading is from Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations, extol him, all you peoples. Praise his love for us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is from Romans 15, verses 14 and 16. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. Yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again, because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God, so that the Gentile might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. But there are things that 
The things that really are family values are the things that, that we understand together without even talking about sometimes. Those are our family values. And we see Jesus coming back to his home. He's back to his hometown. And some of you have you know, memories of a hometown and you go back there once in a while or maybe you haven't been there in quite a while with COVID. But Jesus is from Nazareth. And we're not sure how big Nazareth was as its population fluctuated. So I've seen you know, estimates from a few hundred up to, to a few thousand. But you know, it, it was smaller than Mankato. We know that for sure. But when he came home there, he was going to Galilee. And Israel is kind of in a couple of chunks. There's the southern part of Israel. And then Samaria kind of separates southern Israel from this northern part called the Galilee. The Galilee is about 25 miles wide, 50 miles long. Galilee encircled because it was encircled by non-Jews, by outsiders. And that's where Jesus came home to. When, so when he came to Nazareth, he came to the people that had known him his whole life. Because he had grown up there and he, he's 30 now and he's, you know, run a business there for all these years. These are the people who knew Jesus. They, they could tell his walk from a block away. They could, you know, know his voice in the next room. If somebody told a joke, they could tell which laugh belonged to Jesus. If you think about it, they knew which women had had a crush on him growing up. They knew how he sorted his tools. They knew how he, what time he started work in the morning and what time he liked to quit in the evening. They knew how he liked his fish cooked. They knew his favorite rock to sit upon on the scenic hilltop overlooking Nazareth and the distant valleys. They knew where he sat every week in worship. They knew how important to him were the annual trips to Jerusalem to worship. But lately, Jesus' habits had been changing. He had taken some time off from his business, and he had left it completely. He had been baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. Traveling as a rabbi, he had collected some followers. There were even stories about him turning water into wine at a wedding in a nearby town. And now he's in his home synagogue, and he's reading the scriptures. And they must have been wondering, you know, what will our boy turned rabbi have to say? And what do we read about Jesus? We read that Jesus returned to Galilee. He was teaching in their synagogues. Everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, as he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, say, he, he showed up to worship every week. And you have to wonder, what did he think of the sermons he heard there? I mean, if anybody was qualified to, to assess them and analyze them, he must have heard a lot of silly things said. And yet he kept coming. He, he didn't say, I'm going to go find a better synagogue. He just came to worship. And he, was te he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. So they didn't have a nice little Bible like we do. They, they, they didn't have a nice little book. They, they had this giant scroll, and it was several scrolls just for the Old Testament. And they gave him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he opened to near the end, which was kind of difficult to find because they didn't have chapter numbers. They just, it was just all text run together. He, he opened to Isaiah near the end of the book, Isaiah 61, and he read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendants, and sat down to preach. Well, that's kind of a little curious. He sat down to preach, so the, the way their service went, when it was time to read God's word, when it was time to do this, you stood up. But once that was put away, then you would sit down and begin your
your servant. They, they, didn't, they didn't want to confuse what was being said there. A little, little different from how we do it. So, and then we read what he said. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is like a thunder that he's, that's unrolling in the synagogue there. What did he just say? He said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, saying the spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's saying, I'm the chosen one. I'm Messiah. This is crazy talk, unless it's true. That he is declaring himself to be Messiah, and you wonder, well, how will they respond to this? But you look in verse 22, and it says, All spoke well of him, and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. They liked what he said. They, they did not revolt at this declaration. That's, that's almost surprising to me. But they knew what a good man he was. They knew that he had never cursed. They knew that he had never lied. They knew that he had never or, you know, done anything wrong. He had never cheated any of them in business. He had always kept his word. And so they are impressed with what he says. They seem to see Jesus here. They seem to see who he is and understand. And then it's going to turn a little bit. But seeing Jesus is kind of difficult for some people. And if you have been lied to about Jesus, it's even harder. There's a man named John, Johnny Lee Clary. He grew up in Oklahoma. And his father sent him to Sunday school on the bus every week. But at home, there was a different set of family values. At home, they, Johnny says that his father celebrated hatred. Hated anybody who didn't look like them. When Johnny was 11 years old, his father committed suicide in front of him. He was facing bankruptcy. His wife was unfaithful. After the funeral, Johnny's mother had her boyfriend moved in. And he began to be abusive to Johnny. The police were involved. And finally Johnny's mother said to him, I don't care where you go or what you do, but you're going to get out of my house. She put me on a bus and sent me to California to go live with my sister. 11, 12 years old. Isn't that all? The part of Los Angeles where he was living was riddled with gangs and Johnny was repeatedly beaten by his sister's boyfriend. And he learned that his sister was not going to look after him. He got into the wrong crowds. He found himself feeling helpless and alone. And then he saw David Duke, the leader of the Ku Klux Klan on television. And the man's viewpoints sounded like Johnny's father. And he decided to write Duke a letter describing his life. And soon after, a knock came on the door. Somebody from the KKK to recruit Johnny. Johnny Lee says, I was looking for some place to fit in. I was looking for some place to fit in when I met the Ku Klux Klan. They told me they would be a family to me. And without hesitation, he joined. He was 14 years old. For the next four years, Johnny was indoctrinated with their racist beliefs. And when he was 18, he returned to Oklahoma to begin his own chapter of the, as the Grand Dragon. Then he became a, a professional wrestler named Johnny Angel with the National Wrestling Federation. He became the Grand Dragon of the entire Oklahoma arm of the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. He became the Imperial Wizard nationally of the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And he became an active spokesperson for the Klan, defending racism and violence against anyone who wasn't white. And so 
he appeared on national talk shows like he was on Oprah Winfrey. And he went on a local radio station and debated a black man on the air. And Clary saw this as his chance to prove himself with the Klan. And he sat down with Wade Watts. And Wade Watts looked at him and said, according to Johnny, Wade says, you can't do enough to make me hate you. I am going to love you. I am going to pray for you whether you like it or not. One of them sees Jesus. The other one does not. Johnny Lee did everything in his power to ruin Wade Watts, including setting fire to his church. Reverend Watts never wavered in his promise to pray for Johnny. Johnny and his chapter found themselves under investigation by the FBI, so he resigned so they wouldn't arrest him. But then the KKK didn't trust him anymore, and they abandoned him. And with no hope, Johnny found himself facing the same temptations that his father had faced. He planned to commit suicide. But God, had, God drew his attention to a Bible in the room, and Johnny grabbed it. Johnny said, I thought there was no possible way that the good Lord could forgive somebody like me. Because I had been so full of hate. I had all the violence and lived such a bad life, but I opened the Bible and it fell open to Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. The young man who ran away and came back humble and said, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Can I be your servant, Dad? And how did the father respond? through the biggest party family had, could remember. And Johnny saw Jesus. That's who we need to see. Johnny found himself promising God that he would attend church if God would just get him a job. And then a local car dealership called. So Johnny went to church on Sunday. And he ran to the altar and gave his life to Jesus Christ publicly. We need to see Jesus. And in doing that, you need to see yourself through Jesus' eyes. And this is kind of surprising to me. Often when we talk about, you know, what do we, what do we see in ourselves? Well, we see sin. We, we see brokenness. We see that we've run away and tried to, to make our own way in the world. But Jesus says something really interesting. When he's talking about people who are following him, when he's talking about people whose, whose lives he has changed, people to whom he's given a new heart, Jesus says, a good man brings good things out of the good, stored up or trip in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. If Jesus has forgiven you, when he looks at you, he doesn't see any sin. If you've been in the courtroom and if the judge has said you are not guilty, you don't need to think about it anymore. You are free. They, they can never come arrest you again. It's, the sentence is decided that you are all right. And Jesus says that he comes in with his Holy Spirit and he puts new things in your heart. And Jesus goes, he says, I must proclaim the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he goes out and he declares this good news, and he starts just going around and changing people's lives. So one day, he's walking into a town, and he sees the one man in town that everybody, has, that everybody agrees on. He sees the one man in town that everybody hates. The tax collector. And his name is Levi, or Matthew. And what does Jesus say to him? You despicable cheater, you've robbed everybody in this town. You get... Jesus says, follow me. I, Jesus could see what he was going to do in Matthew's heart and life. Matthew knew he was guilty. And Matthew got up, left everything, and followed him. And in eternity, I hope we get to see some of these different exchanges.
when Jesus called different people to follow him, there was one political radical named Simon, Simon the Zealot, not Simon Peter, another Simon. And Jesus welcomes him as one of his disciples. A man who seemed to have a violent past. And Jesus preaches to them, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back, then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. He's saying, God can come in and bring you into this new family, give you this these new family values. Mel Lawrence, pastor from Wisconsin, has written about it this way. He says, here is an irony. Sometimes God believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. He's, he writes, there is a risk in a generalized statement like this, but here is specifically what I mean. God believes in us, not in the sense that we are objects of faith, or even faithful, but in the sense that he sees the potential he has created in our lives. The potential that he himself put there and longs for us to draw on all the resources and make the good decisions that will produce a steady path of growth. God wants to come in and do new things in your life. He sees what he can do in your life. So I want you to see yourself through Jesus' eyes. And we won't need to see other people, too, through Jesus' eyes. So what goes on in this passage? Well, unfortunately, it takes a really negative turn. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. You will tell me, do in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. He's saying, yeah, you want me to do miracles. That, that would be exciting. But then he says something very pointed. He says, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. He's saying, there were lots of good Jewish widows that needed help. And you know where God sent Elisha? He sent her to a foreign country to help a foreigner who you don't care about, who you look down on, because God loves everybody. And just to make the point, to make sure they understood what he's saying, he repeats it with another example. He hammers a second time he says, and there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian, the foreigner, the outsider, the one you think God doesn't care about. Jesus has surprised them here. He says, God loves us, but God doesn't just love us. God loves everybody. So he says when there were hungry women here, God sent Elijah out of here to help a foreigner. And when there were sick people here, God sent his apprentice, Elijah, <coughs> to a foreign country. To, well, Naaman came to him, but God had Elijah heal Naaman the outsider. In some traditional Jewish teaching, they actually had one sentence that they quoted, God created the Gentiles to be fueled for the fires of hell. I don't even want to repeat that. And that's talking about people from Asia in Europe, in Africa, from the Americas. It's talking about Minnesota. But that's not what Jesus is teaching. Jesus says, I've come for everybody. That's why Doug Mayer read a couple of scriptures for us 
that you may have wondered, why, why are we reading those in Genesis 12? God tells Abraham, all peoples on earth will be blessed to you. Not just your descendants, everybody. Not the people who look like you and talk like you. The people you don't like. The people you don't understand. In Psalm 117, we read, Praise the Lord, all you nations. And in Romans 15, Paul said that he had been sent to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, to the outsiders, with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And so I ask myself now and then, so Lord, who are the outsiders for me? It's easier to talk with people that already understand me and think like me and like the things I like. But what do we read about Jesus in John 1, 9? We read the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus came for the outsiders. So that is Johnny Lee Clary, and that's Wade Watt. That's the man who said he would pray for Johnny Lee, whether he liked it or not. And that there's nothing he could do to stop him from praying. And Johnny Lee tried to burn his church down. And with a newfound relationship with Christ, Johnny Lee turned to the only man who had ever been straight with him, Wade Watts. He said, Reverend Wade Watts and I became best of friends. He took me on the road with me, and he began to mentor me. And Wade Watts was part of Church of God in Christ, which is a denomination which is very largely African American. Not very many white faces. And Johnny was ordained a deacon in this church where he looked different from everybody else. Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. God changes us. He changes our hearts. He became a consultant for the FBI on white supremacy. God works miracles. And so I am always looking around whatever community I'm serving in, and I'm thankful for Resurrection Lutheran Church, and I encourage us to ask ourselves, okay, God, who have you put around us to encourage in Christ? Who, who can we invite to Christ? Who are, who are you welcoming? They don't need to look like me. They don't need to talk like me. They, they don't need to be anything like me. And notes. We're just rolling through Luke. I, I chose this text months ago. I had no idea that this afternoon was going to be the first service of New Changing Life Church of the Nazarene. But lo and behold, it is. And you know, it's a different congregation. But Pastor Thomas, could I ask you to come up and just read a script, scripture for us? For, we want to make sure everybody knows who you are. Because God has work to do in all of us.
You can hold it if you want, or and I think it'll pick you up. If, if I could ask you this question, I think you were taken from your family when you were a boy. Is that correct? So, who, who took you away from your family? Um, in our country, uh, when the war was done, and then uh, we separated with the family. Some people went to the Nepal country for safety, for refugees camp. And then, that is why a lot of young people, they separate from their farm. And then they stay away uh, where they can get service. They will be refugees. And then some of them will be a child soldier. Uh, you guys know it's also done there is child soldier uh, movie. Some of them, and there will be a lot boy come to the United States. That you got here is that it's a part of South Sudan kid. The reason why they call Lord Boy because they don't know where the farm is and if they lie or they're not alive. So how old were you when the army took you and made you a soldier? Uh, some of our people are 15. Mm -hmm. Some of them left 7 years old. You were just a boy? life. We may get to hear more about that another day. But I asked if he would go ahead and read scripture verse for us in English and in Newark. Thank you to the pastor, thank you to the president of 
the church and thank you for the church board and thank you for the all congregation that decide that we will share this building with God here. And I hope this congregation will grow up and you guys will be proud of what the God called. Thank you so much and God bless. Amen. <clears throat>
With our prayers, we commit to loving our neighbor. Let us pray together. Lord, for our nation, its politics, commerce, culture, education, we pray that self-interest, injustice, arrogance, and deceit may not have dominion over our people and leaders. Lord, in your mercy. For our international near neighbors, for Mexico, Cuba, and Canada, that they may be governed wisely and compassionately. For our sister congregation, New Changing Life Church, that they will know your guidance and blessing. Lord, in your mercy. For immigrants and for the indigenous people of our land, that they may have courageous and wise leadership from within, profound understanding and respect from without. Lord, in your mercy. For our young people in this century of abrupt changes and pervasive insecurities, that younger and older generations may respect each other, the knowledge of the Lord will grow among all. Lord, in your mercy. And for any member of our congregation, for those among family or friends who are in crisis today, that according to their bewilderment, pain, or heartbreak, they may find your grace sufficient for their needs. Lord, in your mercy. Our Lord, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, when they had finished eating, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, given for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. God, our Father, in his exuberant and abundant mercy and grace, has given his only Son, our Lord and Savior, to forgive our sins, and to give us faith to trust in this his very promise that in his body and in his blood he redeems us and reconciles us with our Father. And when we ask, when is a person rightly prepared to receive this sacrament, we respond, one who has faith. Thus we boast in Christ because we know that faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the word of God. Forgiving our sins. Thanks be to God. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, our Lord and Savior, who ascending above the heavens and sitting at your right hand, poured out the Holy Spirit as he had promised upon the chosen disciples causing the whole earth to rejoice. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all the people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be, world without end. Amen. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. May the Lord bless all your skills and be pleased with the work of your hands. May you ride across the heavens to help you. May you abound with the Lord's favor and be full of his blessing. Amen. Let's sing together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. 